Hi, this is Wukash from HDB. You're watching the third episode of Import Async IO, an introduction to the Python framework enabling asynchronous single threaded concurrent code using coroutines. This series is intended as a beginner's course, so if you haven't really used Async IO yet, that's perfect. Just start at episode one if you haven't seen that yet. Today, we will finally play with the async await keywords. That's probably what you've been waiting for all along, and yet for an entire two episodes, we haven't used those at all. Today, this will change. In this video, we'll look at using async and await in a variety of ways. We'll start with basic coroutines, but we'll also mention other awaitable objects and discuss tasks later on. But before we get there, we will talk about one of the most important features of the await expression, the ability to await multiple things at once. From there, we'll seamlessly discover how we can fire up tasks uh, to run things in the background including waiting for them to finish and canceling them if we don't want them to finish anymore. So we're also going to talk a bit about futures. However, um, common pitfalls and futures are going to have to wait for the next episode because this one is going to be pretty long, as you'll see yourself. We're going to finish on cancellations uh, in general because I do uh, realize this is an important topic for any production application. So that we're going to do. All right. Uh, before we begin, let me address one thing. Uh, in the last episode, I asked you whether you'd like us to use dark text on white background or vice versa. There's a lot of code in this series. So we wanted to make sure that we are maximally legible. Well, we received a lot of responses, but no clear favorite emerged. I'm sorry we won't be able to accommodate everyone then, but we decided to go with the white background. Uh, this was not a coin flip. I decided to trust the voice of the most experienced teachers uh, that shared their advice with me. Specifically, Zed Shaw uh, points out that dark text on white background compresses better in video, achieving better contrast, and allowing people to see text clearly in more environments, especially on smaller screens. Um, if our videos were very long uh, every time, all the time, it would maybe be less of an obvious choice. But given that every episode is planned to be well under 60 minutes, seems like going with the white background is uh, better on average. So Dave Beasley shares this view. Again, black text on a white background is more legible when minimizing the video, looking at smaller screens, and in general provides maximum contrast. So if you need less contrast, it's possible to dim your screen. But if you don't have enough contrast to begin with, well, it is impossible sometimes to boost it. So that's it. Uh, this is the choice. Sorry if you uh, had the opposite preference. Uh, we appreciate you sharing your opinion. Moving on. In the last video, we discussed running things on the event loop with call soon and call later. Uh, what you schedule that way are just regular functions. They run until they are done. One clever function uh, that we met during this exploration was the trampoline, which did some work and then rescheduled itself back on the event loop. This is not how you program in async IO most of the time. Instead, you'll use async functions, which are more high level. Let's try to create an equivalent async functions to what we're seeing on the screen right now. In other words, an async function that keeps printing out the current timestamp. So first, let's start be Python for today's session. Uh, we will need our print now function that prints the current timestamp. So uh, let's just recreate it. And now we can create an async function which keeps printing the current timestamp at some interval. So it'll take some name. We can use that to identify which uh, async function is currently running. And we just have a while true loop, which just goes and on in an infinite manner, um, prints the name, prints now, and just sleeps for a while, just so that we don't have a, a stream of prints uh, that, you know, that would not be very nice in terms of um, just showing uh, you the examples right now. 
So even before we get to running the code, let's look at our first async function and notice a few interesting things about it. So first, thanks to using the async dev keywords instead of just plain dev, um, the function is compiled as asynchronous. That means we can use await expressions and other async constructs inside it. What does an async expression do? Uh, two things, or well, an await expression. First, when you read this async function, you know that the await expression will block from executing anything else until whatever we are awaiting on is done. In our example, it's guaranteed that the next iteration of the while loop will not happen until we waited at least half a second. Uh, and hold on, in async IO, it's always important to realize that whenever you see a number that is some number of seconds to wait times out and uh, timeouts and whatnot, um, that always means that this is at least how long we're gonna wait. Uh, due to the asynchronous nature of the event loop, the fact that we are running blocking functions on it, and the fact that this is all happening on a single thread uh, means we will never be real time guaranteed, uh, you know, to the nanosecond, um, to the point of the chosen number. So if you are async IO sleeping for half a second, that means we're gonna be sleeping at least half a second. So um, moving on with the await expression that makes it um, natural to read async functions because they read from top to bottom like regular functions. Since the await essentially blocks execution within an async function, there is no callback magic that we need to worry about here. But there's another thing uh, that the await expression is doing under the hood. It allows async IO to do something else while we're waiting for the sleep to finish. So this function is not doing anything else, but the event loop can run other things at that time. Sometimes people will say that when an async function awaits, it yields execution back to async IO, allowing async IO to switch to executing something else in the meantime. So let's see how that works. The easiest way to run an async function is to use asyncio.run. It will run our async function until completion. In our case, well, we'll have to interrupt it with control C because the async function is literally an infinite loop in our definition. So that's a nasty, nasty traceback here. Is there a more graceful way to time out on an async function? Uh, yes, we can wrap our async function in wait for and give it a timeout. So the invocation still raises an exception here, as you will see, but that's a friendly exception, the timeout error. It tells us that the async function did not finish executing before the timeout happened. Naturally, we could have just used an async function that exits on its own in this example, but that would be boring. Uh, if it still bothers you to see a traceback in the console, we can do better. We can define a main function that we will pass to async IO run and treat this as our entry point to the asynchronous world, right? We will do every asynchronous thing from our async main uh, this is a common pattern, in fact. Uh, in real-world async IO applications, you will often see some async main, which is why we're gonna show it to you right here. We still use the same async IO wait for for handling the timeout, but this time the result will be probably a little less dramatic. Let's look uh, what's gonna happen when we actually execute this. So, async IO, the run, and now async main. Cool. Boom, time's up, no exceptions now. Everything was handled very gracefully uh, with the try except. This only shows you that inside uh, functions that are asynchronous, you can also handle exceptions just as you would otherwise. This is also a very helpful thing to understand because uh, exceptions in Python are uh, used for many things, including uh, some control uh, flow, which we're gonna see with cancellations later on in this very video.
So let's look at the documentation for the wait for function. If we actually wanted you to see and you know figure out how to use it, you would uh, see this um, explanation of what uh, wait for does. So what do we have here? Well, there's plenty of new words. Coroutine, awaitable, task, future. All those are in fact related. Um, they are the building blocks of AsyncIO programs. We'll introduce all of those today, but first let's look at a higher level. So here's an abstract class hierarchy of the terms I highlighted before. So you can find awaitable and coroutine in the collections.abc module. Future and task live in the AsyncIO package. So what do we have here? An awaitable is any object that can be awaited on. In other words, put it in a await expression and it will do something useful. To see this better, let's redefine our async main with the objects clearly instantiated. As you can see, we create a kp object here, but it doesn't really run yet. Similarly, we pass kp to a waiter object that we created. That waiter object doesn't start counting seconds just yet. We need to await on it. Okay, that works exactly as before now, but hopefully you can see that awaitables are just regular objects. We can pass them around. If we don't start awaiting on them, nothing will happen. To see this in action, let's recreate our async main again this time forgetting to await on the waiter. What would happen if we just didn't say await? So we'll need a little more space now. Again, we're creating kp and waiter objects exactly in the same manner. So instantiating here, um, but we air quotes forget to await. Like this will look silly now in the try except because we just say waiter, like which is just a variable name. Um, because we created the object on a separate line. But if we created the waiter object right in the try except block without assigning it a name, it would look just like an old style regular function call. When we run our async main, we'll see that async.io helpfully will tell us that we created two objects that we never awaited on. Unused awaitables are often a sign of a bug like this. So it's good that async.io will inform us of it. But this warning doesn't appear by default. You need to start your Python process with python async.io debug equals one. Uh, that's an environment variable. And if you also use python trace malloc set to one, the warning will be much more helpful because it will tell you exactly where you created your awaitable object in your code. Uh, so I use uh, those both pretty much all the time. Uh, there's also a dash x dev mode uh, in Python, which you can use for that as well. However, that does not turn on trace malloc by default because trace malloc does have a performance penalty on it. So moving on. Now we know that an awaitable object is one that we can use in an await expression. There's a few kinds of them, including custom ones that you can create, but that's a topic for a different episode probably. Now we are focused on the coroutine. See, I kept using the term async function when describing functions that are defined with async def and use await inside, right? Sometimes people will call them coroutines, but I like to make a distinction. An async function is the definition. It will create coroutines when called. Coroutines in turn are awaitable objects that you create by calling async functions. So coroutines are awaitable, but async functions are not. So let's see how that works. If you try to async run uh, just that async function, this will not work. It will tell us that the coroutine was expected, but we just got a regular function. But if we actually run a coroutine, that is fine. If you run the other one now, that is also perfectly fine. However, if we tried to execute the one that we already awaited on again, this will not work. Coroutines can be only awaited on once. So just to drill this a bit more, um, an async function is a function that creates coroutines when called. 
It is defined using async def and can use await expressions inside. A coroutine, in turn, is an object that you create by calling an async function. So that object is awaitable. Don't worry if this is a, a little mind boggling right now, it will become more natural the more you use async IO. And most of the time you don't really have to think about the difference between the two. Just like in the example here in the line two, usually you will await on a coroutine that you just created right there on the same line. And it really looks like you just calling a thing. So see, keep printing is an async function, but when called, it creates a coroutine that we immediately await on in our uh, async function right there. So um, the more you do this, the more natural this will get. No worries just yet. I wanted to make the async function and coroutine distinction right at the beginning of our async IO journey because I am a strong believer in no magic. When you understand this distinction, many bugs that confuse beginners will become easy to spot and fix. And believe me, you will forget to type await sometimes and you will uh, try to await on the same coroutine many times. Those things do happen. So most of the mistakes we make are silly mistakes. Now that you understand how those things are composed, it is less likely that you will be absolutely confused when stuff does not work. So now, uh, now that we know that we can await on coroutines, it's time to learn how those things compose. When we put consecutive await expressions one after another, the second one won't start executing until the first one is done. We've already seen it in our infinite loop example before. Similarly, the third one won't start executing until the second one, you know, it reads from top to bottom essentially. So we can check this out ourselves, right? The coroutine that's running now is the first one. It would be an infinite loop, so I had to keyboard interrupt it again. Like the, the second coroutine would never run. But what if we want all the coroutines to run at the same time? Fortunately, this is a built-in feature of AsyncIO and a very powerful one at that. Instead of using many awaits, we will just use one. But we can put our coroutines inside a gather coroutine. So having that defined, running it now will cause uh, stuff to run essentially at the same time. Uh, however, remember that we are not executing in parallel, but concurrently. So all of this is happening in a single thread. First, second, third, awesome. Thanks to cooperative multitasking, that single thread executes multiple coroutines at the same time. Still had to break this here, uh, but we'll deal with, with, with this uh, keyboard interrupt uh, exception later. So I already told you about the bartender analogy, right? Uh, but another great analogy I've seen is this video of workers hammering in a pole. Uh, only one hammer hits uh, at a time, and yet, thanks to cooperation, it completes much faster. So that's essentially how I think about cooperative multitasking, about an event loop doing many things at the same time in just one thread. I hope this is useful for you as well, because I just kind of like the elegance of uh, what you can see on the video, but I think it kind of um, gets me that same feeling. All right, so as usual, let's fix the ugly keyboard interrupt with async.io wait for. See, coroutines compose very well. Just wrapping our gather in a wait for is enough to make it stop running after a predefined time. So we can just um, write the gather inside it, right? That will instantiate the coroutine and now the wait for will deal with this. Let's see how that will execute. Like we still have to recreate like our all uh, three coroutines that we're gonna want to happen at the same time. We set a um, timeout for the five seconds and we say, oh, if there is a timeout error, just print that, oops, our uh, time's up. Okay, let's execute this now and see what happens. So now that we run this, we should see that there is gonna be a timeout, but um, we also see another thing. Well, what is this? AsyncIO is still complaining about some exception that we did not anticipate. Apparently our Keep printing coroutines raised a canceled error exception, but we never retrieved it. 
So this gently introduces us to the concept of canceling. Let's explore that for a while. So let's look at our latest async main function one more time. We only have one await here. We are awaiting on an async I await for, which wraps a gather coroutine, which gathers three keep printing coroutines. So the async I await for is configured to timeout after five seconds, but what does that mean? What does actually happen? We've seen the docs for this function before, and it mentioned that when a timeout occurs, whatever we waited for is canceled. So what were we waiting for? The gather coroutine. So that will be canceled. Now, the gather documentation says that if it gets canceled itself, it propagates the cancellation to all awaitables that is, it is gathering. So far, so good. Async IO wait for timed out, canceled our gather, and gather in turn cancels all three keep printing coroutines. But what does the keep printing coroutine see when it is canceled? Well, when a coroutine gets canceled, uh, what happens inside is that the await expression that is currently executing raises the canceled error exception. So let's look at the code of our keep printing async function. In our case, it only has a single await expression. So we know that the exception is raised right there. I think it's a brilliant design decision to make cancellations exceptions because this composes very well with the rest of Python. I already mentioned that to you that, you know, exceptions are important and the fact that, you know, you can just handle stuff like cancellations with them, it's pretty cool. Let's see how we can deal with those canceled errors though. So there's essentially two options. Either we can handle the canceled error inside of our async function by wrapping it uh, in, in a try accept block, or we just don't do anything and we just let it bubble up and you know um, deal, uh, well, whoever is awaiting on us will deal with it then. So in other words, either we catch the exception or let the caller worry about it. So let's see how catching it ourselves will work. We can reuse our async main function, so let's just redefine keep printing. It will work exactly as before, but now we will wrap the single await expression in our try accept block. So for now, let's just create the infinite loop and do the prints that we wanted. And finally, we have a try with this await for this silly sleep. And now, accept asyncio cancelled error. What should we do? Well, we can say that you know we were cancelled. That will let us see what's happening and just break. Cool. So, can we run this? Let's try. When we run it and it actually gets cancelled we will see that, oh, first was canceled, second was canceled, third was canceled, uh, oops, time's up. Well, but only partial success. The coroutines, in fact, um, nicely reported that they were canceled, but we are still getting complaints from async.io that the canceled error of gather itself wasn't handled by us in any way. And can we fix that? Of course, but before we get there, Let's talk about futures and tasks first. As I mentioned, the coroutine abstract base class can be found in collections.abc alongside its parent, the awaitable. Those are core features of Python. They are built into the interpreter. Futures and tasks are features of the async.io framework. So if you would use Twisted, Tornado, Curio, or Trio, you would still use awaitables and coroutines, but you wouldn't use asyncio's futures and tasks. In other words, the coroutine is a low-level building block. It doesn't know about any asyncio concept like the event loop or cancellations. So this is why the documentation tells you that many of the built-in functions in async.io wrap coroutines in tasks. That action allows async.io to keep track of the coroutines, handle results uh, returned from the coroutine, as well as exceptions raised inside the coroutine, including cancellations. 
So let's first meet the task, right? Um, as just users. So seeing what tasks enable us to do. Um, the mighty task is actually one of the features of AsyncIO that makes it so wonderful. So let's go. But to be quite frank, I expect that at this point, you're probably pretty bored with AsyncIO sleeps. Well, those are kind of silly, right? And I'm not entirely fond of those simplified examples myself. So let's do something more exciting. How about let's write a trivial web crawler? Of course, there's nowhere near the time to make it production grade, but well, the only thing that we need is to crawl some particular set of trivial pages, like the one I just generated here. So the content of a given page here includes hyperlinks to more pages. So you're going to follow those hyperlinks. For simplicity, the URLs are always absolute and always at the start of the line. There's no HTML. Uh, there's no robots and uh, TXT handling or anything like that. It's, it's really relatively a trivial example, uh, but with a twist. There's a 33% probability that a link will actually contain the full copy of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Well, making it a bit slower to download. So that's essentially it. Let's write a web crawler that will download all of this. Ready? I'm ready. So we will be using a third-party HTTP li uh, client library called HTTPX. Just pip install HTTPX and you're done. Uh, I wanted to minimize new APIs and libraries in those videos so that they are not overwhelming, but I guess one doesn't really hurt uh, and will help us do it the right way. So you can see the crawl zero. So the first version, starting with zero, right, uh, will just um, get some prefix, which is going to be our base website address and a given URL. If we don't give it a URL at first, we're just going to uh, use the prefix as the URL. We're going to print that something is happening. Um, and now we cre create the async client, just call client.get. And then finally close the client. Now having the result, we can split lines on the text of the result. And whenever we find uh, the prefix means we found a link. Let's just await on another crawl, right? So pretty simple right here. Uh, even if you didn't know HTTPX before, that should probably read like English, right? We created an async client and we were just getting it. So now we're already crawling it. Uh, it already does its job, but this will actually take a long while. Um, as you can see, like, you know, there's downloads that are happening rather slowly. So let's pop up our uh, session side by side so we can discuss uh, how it works and what's wrong with it actually, right? As you can see on the left side already, it's slow. So there's something wrong. Well, but there's actually uh, four things that I don't like about this initial version of ours. So first of all, I don't like when things that do um, kind of backend tasks, backend activity, also are responsible for reporting their status. So reporting progress from that same task, I don't like it, especially if it's just a print or logging, like, you know, all of those probably not great ideas. And then if you really follow this await crawl zero inside an async function that is already called crawl zero, that is a recursive form. Um, that might be a little annoying later uh, if we really had gigantic uh, and very deep websites. So that's probably something that we should avoid as well. And then await crawl is essentially recreating a blocking environment because we only ever crawl zero on one particular URL. So we are not using any of the nice features of AsyncIO that allow concurrency. And finally, maybe you notice that we uh, are getting the async client just like that, and we should probably not do it uh, and use a context manager instead. You're right. However, I would like to introduce all of those concepts one by one. So we're not going to be using asynchronous context managers just yet. But we listed four things uh, that I didn't like. We can probably fix at least some. 
and maybe more incrementally, right? So I'd start by storing our URL in a variable so I have less to type later. And now let's write a progress reporting async function. So if we want to report progress uh, in an elegant way, like we will take the URL and another async function. See, it's a callable that returns a coroutine. It's what I told you, look like it's the ty static typing tells you exactly the same. So, oh, we have our first task created here. We pass it a coroutine and set a name, which is a good practice that helps with debugging. So now, to really report progress, we need to know where we are. So we'll be using a to-do set uh, that holds URLs. Let's measure the time between uh, when we start and we finish. Uh, and then while there's still stuff to do, let's print the status. So there's like, you know, some complicated printing because I wanted to show uh, our nice, you know, like length of the to-do list and maybe some members of the to-do list. Uh, we cannot quite show the entire thing because the uh, our uh, console is kind of um, narrow. So let's just show the last 38 characters. So now we still have our old friend async io sleep. Well, just because we don't want to print the status, you know, kind of all the time. We just want to print it out often enough so that I, as a human, know what's going on. So now that we ended, we only need to measure the time elapsed and report how long it all took. So that fixes the reporting and actually gives us a form of a benchmark. Well, it's not like a strict benchmark in the sense that you would actually use to, um, you know, deal with uh, problems with your programs, but it's a good thing to know. So now let's create a to-do set uh, and recreate the crawl function actually. So it uses the to-do set, right? Um, so now we already um, created the crawl one async function. So it's gonna have that same signature. So it has a prefix, which is our base address for the website and the URL. If we didn't pass the URL yet, we're just gonna use the prefix at the very start. Again, we're creating uh, the async client for us. And now we are awaiting on a client get to actually get the contents of the URL. Now that we are done, we can close the client and split lines on the text in the result. And if the uh, line happens to look like another of our URLs, we're just gonna, oh, add it to our to-do uh, set and await on it again. So like we're not changing that yet. We will in fact just do this incrementally. So, oh, we also have to discard uh, things from the to-do set when we are done, right? With our own URL on the invocation. So running this again will uh, show us some uh, interesting results. We already see how uh, all of this nicely, nicely runs uh, step by step, uh, but this will essentially be as slow as the um, example that I showed you before. So um, let me show you this nice um, printout, let's call it, uh, of the progress um, async function, just so that we can still look at it once more and talk a little about the create task. Well, what is it? Like, how come does anything actually happen? We are not awaiting on the task anywhere, and yet we clearly see on the left side of the screen that there are in fact things that happen. Uh, let me just remove my head so you can see the entire uh, code. And there's not much there, but you know, it may be helpful. So anyway, um, create task. What it does is it tells async.io that now um, there is going to be a coroutine that async.io tracks. So um, it will run our thing in the background. Like literally in the background of our current execution context, uh, meaning it will only run whenever we are awaiting on something. So the await async IO sleep are the gaps in which background tasks are actually executing. So all, all of this took 94 seconds. Well, that is pretty disgusting to be honest with you. The new crawl function um, is a kind of um, still slow. Well, we can do much better. 
I'm pretty sure we can do much better than this. So let's just recreate a function that will be essentially the same with one important difference. We won't be awaiting for the crawl, but rather just uh, using what we already saw, scheduling crawls as background tasks. So all of this that you're seeing right now is the same, but now that we split lines and we find a line that looks uh, like a hyperlink, right, a URL, uh, we will, okay, add it to the to-do list, but now we will create task. Create task, essentially saying crawl to here with the prefix and the line, which is the URL in the, our case, we will actually put a name there, which is great. Uh, it is a good practice that uh, gives, um, you know, a descriptive name for debugging purposes. So we still discard and whatnot, and let's just run that and see what happens. Okay, so, so far so good, looks exactly the same. Oh no, it doesn't. We ran 20 of them at the same time at some point, right? So there was much more concurrency actually. Took 13 seconds instead of 94. That's over seven times faster to do the same work on the same internet connection and still using just one thread. So that should get you excited, but that's the power of async IO essentially. Um, so now we um, saw that this concurrency thing uh, enables us to do a lot of things even just with a single thread. And while this was, I hope, an impressive demo of what tasks can accomplish, uh, we shouldn't let them run wild like this. So if we just create tasks and they're just happily doing things in the background, well, what if we actually want some result from them? Or what if something goes wrong in them? Uh, there's an exception that is happening or whatnot. Like, in fact, if our progress meter got canceled or otherwise got interrupted, wouldn't we want for those background tasks to also be canceled instead of just continuing until they're done, maybe a long time later? Uh, like we would expect actually for the pending tasks to be canceled as well. But since they are running in the background, that would not happen unless we do something about it. So if we want to stop our application altogether, we'd like to either cancel the tasks gracefully, maybe in some cases we would even wait for them to finish. Maybe that's, that's not a very long operation and it's nicer to just allow for whatever is happening to you know, come to its conclusion, or at least you could ask the user, hey, are you sure? Like, you know, you're, you're attempting to quit, but there's pending downloads. So it is essentially a very good practice to have handling like this. All right, uh, so now, cool. So we need to store the tasks somewhere to be able to cancel them uh, when our progress indicator gets canceled itself. Is that clear? Like that essentially means we need to have handles to our tasks so that we can send them information that we want them to be canceled. So fortunately, we already have a to-do set. It just used to be some useless URLs that we used for printing, but we only need to modify it so it holds the actual tasks. As you can see, the diff here is pretty small. Uh, there's actually no code behind my back here. Um, that is all that we need to change in the crawl to function. So as you can see, I even removed the line that discards the URL that was already dealt with. But why? Well, we won't need it anymore because async.io will help us maintain this set with its async.io.wait function. So we need to change the progress async function now, right? Our progress meter needs to handle this new life. Um, we need to make it uh, understand this new to-do set. So first we'll store the created task in a variable so that we can add it to the to-do set as well, right? We're gonna be using that same functionality that we just saw, uh, just as we did in this modification to crawl to. Now, instead of async.io sleeps, we'll be using async.io.wait as I told you about uh, 
in the last slide. So async I await right here. It takes a collection of tasks. So our to-do set is great for this. And as the name implies, waits for them to complete. But we actually want to report progress uh, while things are still going on. So we're setting a timeout on the wait. Unlike uh, async I await for, this function will not raise an exception. Instead, it returns two sets of tasks, done tasks and tasks that are still pending. To clean up our to-do set, we're removing the done tasks from it. Now, we only need to print the current status, which we are doing. Uh, I used more characters per line because we are using this entire width that we have. Um, and that's it essentially, right? Uh, the rest is pretty much the same. So let's see how this new progress works. All right, now we see uh, it kind of raising its um, concurrency also pretty well, up to 20, goes down a bit because the longest downloads are now going on. Also uh, took 13 seconds. So same performance, uh, but a much cleaner approach because we are essentially tracking our tasks now. We know at any given point what are uh, the actual pieces of context, pieces of code that are uh, running on the event loop. Well, okay. So uh, the very last thing I wanted to show, because uh, that was the happy case right now, is that we can cancel pending tasks when interruptions happen. So for example, if somebody actually decides to uh, kill your process or you need to recreate something because you changed the network port that you're listening on or something like this, um, we can cancel whatever is pending so that we don't have things that are incomplete. This is our large topic actually. So um, I won't cover everything just yet, um, but it's important enough to just cover it right now, right here, at least in some basic form. So thanks to our to-do set, in fact, like we, we have just the thing that lets us clean things up. So um, let's leave our trusty progress function alone uh, and just deal with cleanups in a new async main. We've seen async main at the start of this video, so we can use it again. Um, we can await on the progress uh, with a given address and an algorithm, arc roll to, right? But when an async IO cancelled error happens, now we will go through our to-do set and cancel everything on it. But we are nice people, so we are still going to give it one last uh, chance to finish. We'll remove things that are done from the to-do set we'll remove things that are pending from the to-do set and even cover an unlikely but kind of um, annoying uh, thing that can happen. Um, more tasks added while we were canceling already. We'll discuss this on the next slide. So now trying to run this, uh, we'll see that, well, we cannot really just async I run anymore. So let's just take the loop, create our task for async main, and using um, call later that we met in the last episode, we can just run task cancel on it like 10 seconds from now, right? So we'll just kill it then. So now running it until complete, we'll see that in fact, oh, it did cut short. The task does not indeed uh, finish uh, before crawling the entire website. But see, there are no warnings. There are no exceptions. We cleaned up after ourselves rather gracefully here. Uh, so what is uh, now the point of um, the warning that we introduced in the code before? So let's think about this. What, is, what can happen is... Um, Async IO create task is not itself awaitable, right? You didn't say await uh, async IO create task. You just ran that instruction and it scheduled things on the event loop right there, right then. That is itself uh, really powerful. It doesn't take much time, so why await? Cool. But if you are 
cancelling things, you have to realize that cancellations as exceptions only happen during await expressions. So there can be a very unlucky course of events in which you are trying to cancel a thing, but you just, just about missed your chance and whatever is happening later actually managed to create a task for the background. So while this does not happen in the examples that we have uh, we had in this video, um, it is good to have this realization right now that cancellations might be tricky and entirely graceful things might uh, well graceful shutdowns might require multiple passes of like decreasingly big sets of tasks that are still somehow pending. All right, uh, so that's essentially it for today's episode. Uh, today, you learned about async functions and coroutines. How are they related, but how they're different as well. Uh, what can you await on and how to await on many things at once. We saw tasks uh, and how they enable us to run things in the background. We learned how to wait on them and how to keep track of them and cancel them if needed. So that was a lot of information just in one go. We'll continue working with coroutines, tasks, and futures in the next video. I promised you futures, we didn't really get to them today. So there will be some focus on future objects in particular next time around. We look how all this is implemented in Python, but we will also cover some typical pitfalls in async IOUs and how to avoid them. We've already seen a missing await. There's quite a few more. So subscribe to make sure you will get notified uh, when the episode is out. Um, thanks for watching. See you next time.